Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Tom Krejci from Northwestern University in Chicago, uh, and I am here to introduce Dr. Oh, Roderick e Eckenhoff to us this afternoon. Rod comes to us from the University of Pennsylvania, where he is uh, the Austin Lamont Professor of Anesthesiology and Critical Care as well as their vice chair for research. He uh, heads up the Penn Center for Anesthesia Research, which is a multidisciplinary uh, research center. Um, and his most recent work and most of his life work is searching for the holy grail in the molecular pharmacology of inhalation anesthesia. Uh, this afternoon, he's gonna give us an update on mechanisms of general anesthesia. Uh, Rod started medical school at Northwestern University, where his dad just happened to be the dean, uh, and then went back to Penn for his subsequent training, and he has stayed there since. So with great pleasure, Rod, thank thanks. you. Thanks, Tom. So um, this is a, going to be a, uh, uh, just a couple quick disclosures. Avid is funding a study of mine in x Aesthetics. I'm on its board. So Peter asked me to um, summarize uh, sort of where we are, what's, the, uh, what's an update on mechanisms of anesthesia in 2015 based on the recent uh, BON meeting, the MAC meetings. Um, so a quick executive summary is we still don't know. Um, so you can stop listening if you want, but um, there, there has been some progress and, and uh, I think it's kind of, kind of interesting. I apologize to those of you who were at the MAC meeting. I know Stu and Doug and, and uh, Vesna and Bob, Bob, hi Bob, I didn't see you back there, um, were there, so I apologize to them. Uh, but there, you might find some new stuff here or maybe you weren't listening uh, when you were at the meeting, but whatever. So the, the MAC meetings have changed in, in, uh, in uh, character over the years. I've been going to them for 25 years. And uh, they initially were all about molecular targets, electrophysiology, functional effects on those targets, and so forth. They've changed a lot uh, to where now the uh, molecular targets are still there, but uh, sort of in, uh, less, less, less emphasized. And now we have a host of new topics that are uh, being included in this, in this meeting, which has led to an expansion in its time, too. It's a three-day meeting now. Uh, so neurotoxicity, neuroprotection, sleep, uh, network activity, uh, a little bit of drug development, uh, side effects, uh, and so forth. So it's become a very broad meeting, and to try to summarize this in 30 minutes is, is an impossible task. So I won't. Uh, what I'm going to do is focus on what uh, is near and dear to my heart, and which I think I've made contributions to, and some of you in the room have as well. And that's basically on where we are with molecular targets and what if anesthetics do to those molecular targets to produce the effects that we uh, love uh, and are near and dear to our heart. So that's mostly the story of the ligand-gated ion channels, uh, but we'll talk about voltage-gated ones too in a minute. Uh, and these are the ligand-gated uh, cis-loop ion channels, and uh, uh, the primary question uh, has been, uh, as long as I've been involved with it and still is, trying to understand uh, where, where binding sites for inhaled an or anesthetics, general anesthetics are, and in state-dependent structures. And this is important because it's important to know what the molecular determinants are, the energetics are, that produce the immobilization of the ligand in, within a protein matrix to try, to try to figure out what we can do to make our drugs different, better in some way. And so that's still sort of the holy grail, and that's where I think a lot of the progress has been made uh, in this field. So this has mostly been the story of photo labels. Uh, we started off foolishly uh, many years ago looking at the inhaled anesthetics here, trying to make photo label analogs of the, uh, of the inhalational drugs, starting with halothane. It didn't require any, any modification to do this to halothane. But it did to things like isoflurane, and we now have a sebofluorane uh, uh, photo affinity analog as well. But this has been picked up by a number of groups around the world now where Keith Miller looks at uh, the, the alcohols and the barbiturates and uh, the atomidate analogs, uh, Alex Evers and Doug Covey at WashU have looked at uh, the neurosteroids. But, the, but what I'm gonna talk about mostly today, and these are all, by the way, these are all uh, photo affinity analogs, and you'll see that in common they have this, this constrained three-membered ring, which is a carbon and two nitrogens called a diazerine. 
uh, there, that's pretty much been the universal group because when you cleave it, it cr uh, creates a, carb a, uh, a carbene, a very reactive carbene, which is very useful. I'll get to that in a second. But what I'm gonna talk about mostly today are the alkyl phenols. Uh, there have been several analogs created. This is propofol that's near and dear to our heart. Uh, this is a drug that we created called azipropofol in the meta position. So we, we took off the isopropyl arm, stuck it down here at the meta position. Uh, stabilize this, uh, this ring with a trifluoromethyl right here. Uh, that's important uh, photochemically. This was made by a, uh, at the time he was an undergrad, but he's now a CA3 resident in our department, and Bill Daly. And uh, this, this uh, molecule was made by the, um, uh, Keith Miller and John Cohen up at uh, uh, Harvard. And this analog was made by Nick Franks and uh, the Imperial College at the UK. So they're all analogs of, of propofol. They all work as anesthetics, uh, which tells you a little bit about the extreme uh, tolerance of the alkyl phenol chemotype uh, for, uh, for tolerating additions and, and changes and so forth. Just to remind you how this all works, uh, what you do is you incubate your protein of interest or your gamish of interest uh, with your, uh, your diazerine photo label analog, uh, in this case, uh, azipropofol in a meta. Uh, and then you hit it with light. This is important. Uh, you have to hit it with UV light of the correct wavelength. That causes the, the nitrogen to leave as an uh, a inert molecule, leaving a carbene a very reactive carbene, which then bites into the protein. And it's important that it bite into wherever it happened to be prior uh, to the photolysis step. And then by virtue of either a uh, radio label, like a tritium or a carbon-14 on, the, on the, your ligand molecule, you can, you can or using a mass uh, spectrometer to find this mass adduct, you can trace where it is. You can trace it. Um, all the way from the, the target molecule itself to identify what target molecule it's bound to out of a complex mixture, or you can uh, take it down to the individual amino acid residue level uh, in a known protein, uh, or you can even do it nowadays from a gamish of complex uh, proteins as well. So the desirable features that you want in an experiment like this are, first of all, this has got to mimic the activity of the parent molecule that you're trying to mimic. It's got to mimic that activity, and that means uh, the, the in vivo activation, the in vivo uh, effects, mobilization, anesthesia, what have you. Uh, it's got to mimic binding, preferably to a protein where you have a crystallized parent molecule in complex. Uh, it's, it should modulate things that you think are important to the activity of the parent molecule. So these are all things that you need to do to validate the activity of your, your, your photo label. It's got to be stable. Uh, this has been an issue with some of the, the, the molecules that are out there on, on a laboratory's time frame in any case, or in, in vivo. It's got to develop, it's got to demonstrate photochemical non-selectivity. And what I, I just mentioned that a minute ago, it's got to bind to whatever amino acid uh, atom or, 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 or moiety that happens to be sitting next to it at the time. It can't, it can't go searching around for the best place to photochemically interact with uh, because that would give you misleading results as to where these sites are. Uh, it should show post-photolysis activity. This is something that very few groups do. In fact, we're the only group that's done this. And it should show protection from adduction by the parent compound. And I'll say, I'll call this competition, but it's not tri strictly competition. Competition implies an equilibrium uh, setting, and this is very definitely non-equilibrium. So I'll call it, it's, it's got to show protection. In other words, if you add propofol into the mixture, uh, regular propofol, the parent molecule, it should protect, if that's an actual binding site for propofol, it should protect the site from photoadduction by your photo label. So those are things that you should find in this. And let's just, uh, let's just walk through uh, some of these quickly for azipropofol and here's azisoflurane. It binds to pretty much every amino acid. Uh, these are different examples of proteins that we photo label. It binds to all of the different amino acids in these, uh, in these particular molecules. Uh, azisoflurane binds to many of them as well for the examples that we have. Uh, it certainly demonstrates uh, uh, the in vivo activity that propofol does. Here's propofol in red for the uh, dose response curve in tadpoles. Here's azipropofol. It, it's very, very similar in terms of its activity, at least in tadpoles. Uh, 
Uh, we just heard that tadpoles might not equal humans. Um, and it should demonstrate what we call optoanesthesia. So optoanesthesia is uh, basically if you take the molecule, you equilibrate it uh, in the intact organism, and then you shine UV light on that organism, that animal should stay asleep for a while uh, if the anesthetic is binding to pharmacologically relevant sites, and it's binding efficiently enough to mimic occupancy in the non-photolabel uh, experiment. And that's shown here. So in other words, you can shine a light on a, on a tadpole with this stuff in it, and it stays asleep for hours instead of a few minutes. We're doing this in, in, uh, we're doing this in, in mice now by implanted laser uh, uh, probes in, into their brain to find, try to map out what the important areas in a brain of a mouse might be for, for anesthesia. And again, basically what uh, this shows is that the molecular targets that produce immobility are the ones that are actually modified. And photolabeling efficiency is, is sufficient enough to mimic equilibrium occupancy. And it does, these, these animals do wake up, and that's another interesting question is why they wake up. So a few misconceptions about photolabeling. Nonspecific binding is high. This is absolutely wrong. It's very, very difficult to detect nonspecific binding. Uh, it, it adducts to side chains. Everybody who does this, uh, it, when they put their models of the protein three-dimensional structure up, they show, it, they show the, the, the uh, parent molecule next to a side chain of this photoadducted side chain. And that's an incorrect assumption as well. Uh, we think that a significant amount of the time it's binding to backbone atoms, so the carbonyl oxygen, for example, on the other side. So that could make a big difference in how you reconcile this with a three-dimensional structure. So finally, let's get to the cis loop uh, channels and what do we know about them. Very early on, it was all about the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor because that's the one that we had a structure of, a cryo-EM structure at the time. The problem with this uh, molecule, th this, this protein and the early attempts at photolabeling is we found sites uh, in many, many places. This is, these are time average sites from a molecular dynamic simulation for isofluorine on the, uh, on the nicotinic receptor, and there are many sites. And so the challenge is to figure out which of those sites are what we call specific and which of those sites actually transduce uh, the effect that we're interested in. So then came along um, the, a, a, homo, a, a homomeric protein uh, uh, from a uh, bacteria that is very much uh, ligand-gated ion channel type, although the ligand was not clear at the, at, the, uh, at the outset. And this was done by Nuri and Jim Sonner in the back of the room here uh, back a few years ago. And this was co-crystallized. This is probably one of the very few membrane proteins that we have that's been co-crystallized with two different general anesthetics, propofol and desflurane. And interestingly, they ended up at the transmembrane transmembrane domain at the intra subunit. So the transmembrane domain of these proteins is a four helix bundle that's inserted into the membrane. And so you can have an intra membrane site or you can have an inter membrane uh, site. And in this case, uh, there was an, there were kind of both, but propofol tended to bind in the inter, I'm sorry, intra uh, membrane sites on, uh, on this particular ion channel. So the nice thing about having this three-dimensional structure of, in a crystal structure of a, of a similar kind of ion channel, it allowed us to go back now to the nicotinic receptor and improve our structural homology models of it. And when we did that uh, and photolabeled it with uh, azepropofol, we found that in, similar to Glick, we find azepropofol binds at an intra-subunit site in the transmembrane domain, a poor site, and a, a sort of a weak inter-membrane inter, uh, site on, uh, on the nicotinic receptor. Now, a lot of, uh, this is interesting. There we go. Going back to Glick now, uh, so we took our same azepropofol molecule to, to try to give us a little more confidence that it was reflecting a, a propofol binding site. We photolabeled Glick with uh, azepropofol, and we found that, indeed, all of the residues, so here's propofol, the crystallographic site for propofol in Glick, 
And here are the residues that are modified by azepropofol in, uh, in Glick, showing, and this is just a modeled in structure of the uh, azepropofol molecule, showing that they bind in almost ex in, uh, in an exact, exactly the same uh, situation and probably in the same pose within this site. And azepropofol does inhibit the Glick molecule as well. And if we compare that same intra subunit site, so this is Glick, and this is Glick here again showing the residues that are altered and the crystallographic location of propofol, uh, and you compare that to an analogous section of the nicotinic receptor and look at all of the residues that have been modified by a number of different general anesthetics, including azepropofol, we find that this is a fairly conserved uh, binding site for general anesthetics in the nicotinic receptor. So an intra-subunit site seems to, be, uh, seems to be what's happening in the inhibited form of the, of the ligand-gated ion channels. Glick has also given us some interesting information about reconciling structure and function in, in, these, uh, in these proteins. And this was work done by Pei Tang and colleagues showing that uh, if you look at the he M2 helix tilt or, or the change in its dynamics as a, as a function of time and also as reflecting its state, its conductive state. Um, and then you look at the occupancy of each of these sites, because after all, there's a lots of sites we need to understand which are the most important to produce the effect of the anesthetic on this channel. And then you map the, the different angles against each other, uh, whether it's bound to one, five, three, two, or one, or, or sorry, I'm sorry, zero, five, three, two, or one propofols, you find that actually asymmetric occupancy with, a, with only three propofols is much more productive in pushing this to a closed state as compared with even if you have five. Five is not much different than zero. So this gives us some insight as to what occupancy of these sites might do and sort of the surprising notion that saturation of all these sites has a smaller effect on the protein's function than a, 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 a lower level of occupancy of these sites. Remember I mentioned a minute ago that the pore site was labeled in the nicotinic receptor, and so what about the pore? That's an obvious site uh, for, for changes, especially in, in an inhibited ion channel. Um, this was work done by uh, Grace Brannigan and uh, Labard in the, in the Klein group at, at Temple, showing that propofol and also, it, propofol forms these sort of dimers in the pore. Uh, isofluorine does the same thing. Uh, the pore was occluded in the initial glick structure by detergent. In fact, most of the proteins that I've shown you so far uh, have had crystal structures or have been in a form that included detergents. Uh, and so the pore may have been occluded. So it's still not clear whether the pore is an important site for anesthetics. I think the pore was something that uh, Stu Foreman proposed a number of years ago as a preferential site in, uh, in some of these channels. So we still don't have an answer to the pore uh, as to whether it's involved. ELIC is another bacterial uh, gated ion channel, pentameric ion channel. Um, this has given us some state-dependent information now because we have it in both a resting and a desensitized state. This is work that's uh, in, in press at the time, at the, at the moment. Found a number of photolabeled sites both in the extracellular domain uh, and in the transmembrane domain. Here's a site, this is black area, is a, uh, is a surface rendering of propofol in this site. These are the photolabeled residues, but only in the resting state. In the desensitized state, we didn't find uh, anything there at all. So now we're starting to get some evidence for uh, state-dependent binding in which of these states might, uh, might control the effect on function. Interestingly, because of the extracellular sites in these proteins, you would have to ask the question, which is controlling the effect on function? Is it the transmembrane sites or the extracellular sites? And so Pei went back and did a chimera where she took GABA receptors, which are potentiated, uh, did, the, did the chimeric analysis by putting the GABA receptor transmembrane domain on the ELIC extracellular domain to ask the question, which is controlling the effect, the transmembrane domain or the extracellular domain? And she found that GABA, if you have a GABA receptor transmembrane domain, you get potentiation even in ELIC. If you have uh, 
the uh, ELEC transmembrane domain, you get inhibition. So it appears that the transmembrane domain sites are the ones that control, uh, control function. Finally, the GABA receptor. This was kind of interesting because there's been some disagreement in the, uh, in the literature over, uh, over this. So we have two analogs that have uh, 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 photolabeled the GABA receptor. We have uh, our azepropofol meta and we have the Frank's group uh, O-propofol diazerine. And um, the, they came up with slightly different uh, results. So for example, this, this, these are all from, from, uh, from our work with, in, in collaboration with John Cohen up at, uh, at uh, Harvard, where we found that they, we have intermembrane sites here. That's what these are. Uh, this is an alpha, beta uh, type uh, pentamer. Uh, whereas the Franks group found that there was a, a histidine modified here, which is sort of just off the pore. Initially, they modeled this as being also an intermembrane uh, site, but it turns out that when we, we got some additional structures uh, from the uh, GLUCL and from uh, the beta-3 uh, homomer of, of GABA, that that histidine was actually a pore site. So, uh, I think some other work has been done. I think, Stu, you've done some work and others that uh, suggest that uh, this histidine is probably not uh, a site for, uh, for propofol, and it's probably these inter-membrane, uh, these inter-subunit uh, sites on, uh, on GABA. So the next question that you should be thinking is, these are all, as I mentioned a, a minute ago, these are all proteins that are basically um, uh, expressed highly biased because we think these are important, so we express them, we, we uh, put them in detergent, and then we do binding assays and we study them. And so it's very, very uh, uh, sort of a biased uh, question. So the real question is, are these same binding sites, are these same targets, first of all, but binding sites within those targets uh, found in natural receptors in their native membrane environment? And so we've, we've uh, introduced a, uh, a, a sort of a novel uh, method to study that question. So we've made another analog of propofol. This is what we call azepropofol click. Azepropofol click uh, adds an alkyne group, which was not found in biology, over here on the end. And again, you have to show that it's an anesthetic, and in fact it is. Just amazingly how tolerant the alkyl phenol uh, chemotype is for modification. Uh, so it's, it's still, still an anesthetic, a little less potent, but it's still an anesthetic. And you, by doing click chemistry, once you photolabel this onto a parent uh, onto a target molecule, you, you have this alkyne uh, waving around in the breeze, and then you can do something called click chemistry, which allows you, through this copper-catalyzed cycloaddition uh, reaction, to add something containing either an affinity tag or a fluorophore or something like that, uh, onto this molecule. So now you have a target molecule with your adducted anesthetic uh, now containing a, another tag to allow you to enrich it. Because one of the problems, of course, with these ion channels is they're not very abundant. And your mass spec approaches are going to be highly, highly swayed by the abundance of all the other proteins like tubulin and VDAC and complex one and so forth and so on. Uh, and so very quickly, uh, the, what you do is you separate these things. This is a sophisticated approach to, to pulling out and quantitating what the differences are. So you, you either add propofol and UV light, no UV light, or just UV light alone. This is a competitor or a protective agent. Uh, you, you go through all these reactions individually. You tag them with a, uh, a mass tag that's either light, intermediate, or heavy. At the end of this, you mix them back together, and then you do the mass spec. And doing the mass spec all at the same time when the presence of these different mass tags allows you to do accurate quantitation of proteins of targets that are either enriched uh, and or sensitive. Enriched means that they are uh, much enriched compared to no UV, UV light or UV light, and sensitive means that it's displaced or protected by the addition of propofol. And uh, very quickly, what we find when we do that, we find a number of proteins that are enriched, suggesting that there are many targets of the, uh, the propofol-like drugs. Uh, but if you look at the GABA receptors, we find that only alpha and beta subunits 
are, uh, are enriched. We've looked actually for a number of the others using different approaches in this enrichment assay and cannot find them. So this strongly suggests, as others have argued for, uh, that the alpha-beta interface is a preferred binding site for general anesthetics in these, in these compounds. And they're all displaced uh, by the parent compound, again, indi indicating, suggesting at least, that these are specific sites. So, in summary, for the ligand-gated channels, uh, the inhibited channels shown here tend to have uh, transmembrane domain uh, sites. Uh, they may or may not have pore binding. That's still an open question. And asymmetric binding seems to be uh, functionally important. The potentiated ion channels, such as GABA-A, also uh, a TMD, uh, transmembrane domain site, but in this case, inter-subunit. So reconciling how the different location in these differently affected uh, transmembrane proteins are affected is something that is, uh, I think, going to be of, of interest in the future. And also that the alpha-beta interfaces are, are preferred in the ligand-gated channels. I will point out here, uh, this is mostly for Jim Sonner's benefit, uh, but I, I believe it as well, uh, that lipids, especially cholesterol, uh, have, I think, still received too little attention, and it's uh, an, an open question as to how they're uh, interacting with these proteins to cause the effects that we see. Um, there have always been a smattering of lipid uh, posters and, and presentations at MAC meetings over the years. This year, at, at, in Bonn, I think there was one poster that, uh, that mentioned lipids. So li lipids are definitely uh, uh, not being given the attention that I think they deserve. We also captured with that approach, that click approach, we also captured both uh, sodium and potassium voltage-gated channels. You can see here that they are enriched and are also displaced. Um, interestingly, the HCN, not exactly voltage-gated, but the HCN channels are also uh, included here. The voltage-gated channels have been established by Hemmings, Mike Alkier, Manuel Covarrubias, and others as being sensitive and certainly plausible uh, targets for the inhaled anesthetics. We have photolabeled those also with azepropofol and find a single labeled residue shown here. That residue is uh, in what's called the S45 linker. It's a hinge between the voltage sensor and the pore domain. In the voltage-gated channels, it's a perfect place to disrupt its function. This is uh, Pat Law and colleagues at Drexel that help us uh, express these proteins. But the interesting part about it is, here we have a nice binding site for an anesthetic in a protein that is insensitive to anesthetics. So KV1.2 is, is this. This is the data from Manuel's lab showing that basically this protein at reasonable concentrations is pretty much insensitive to most general anesthetics. Propofol is like right here. Butanol, maybe it's a little sensitive. SIVO, maybe it's a little sensitive. But basically, it's insensitive. So the question is, in a, in a potassium channel that is sensitive, like K-Shaw-2, slightly different um, sequence in this same S4-5 linker shown here, what if we modify some of these residues, mutate them uh, from these to these? This is the labeled residue. And when you do that, you dramatically enhance the function of anesthetics on this particular channel. So now you've taken this to this by changing these five amino acid residues, and it turns out actually only, the, only this last one uh, this glycine to threonine is the one that's important. That's the one that recapitulates the entire effect. So our hypothesis was this was a nice system to study because it uh, allowed us to hypothesis is how is this binding site that we identify on the S4-5 linker altered by these particular mutations? So the short answer is not at all. If you look at easy propofol binding to KV1.2, K-Shaw, Fract, which I just mentioned, and then this, K, this uh, uh, glycine to threonine mutation here, uh, the same region is photolabeled. Nowhere else in the protein, by the way. We get very high sequence coverage, and it's not labeled anywhere else in the protein. Uh, 
Um, and in the one that recapitulates all of the activity of this, we get the, exactly the same residue being labeled. AZ isoflurane labels the same region. So what this says is whether sensitive or not, all of these KV channels bind the anesthetics in the same conserved location. And that location is shown here in this S4-5 linker. This is work done by Wei, Wei Ming Bu, Bu in my lab. And, and I think this is something that's not been considered uh, uh, too much in the mutagenesis field, but mutagenesis can affect transduction of occupancy, not necessarily occupancy itself. So when you, when you mutate a residue uh, in, in, the, in the hopes or in the thought that you're changing occupancy of a small molecule like an anesthetic, it may or may not. Uh, and this shows very nicely that really what you're doing is you're altering the, the energies of the different state transitions between the active resting and desensitized state. So you're allowing that occupancy to have a different effect, a different transduction than it would have otherwise. As we heard this morning from Doug, um, a lot, of, a lot of beneficial effects can come from uh, trying to eliminate side effects rather than improving primary effects. All of these drugs that we use seem to produce anesthesia, but they all have a host of side effects that are something we, we don't typically like to see in our patients. And so there has been a growing effort uh, to identify what some of these side effect targets are. So for propofol, a uh, uh, graduate student in my lab, Brian Weiser, found that the sirtuin-2 um, is a, which is a, um, a deacetylase, uh, is um, potently inhibited by propofol. We know what the binding site is now. We know that it's state dependent. Uh, we understand a lot about it. Uh, and interestingly, sirtuin-2 has significant uh, roles in neurodegeneration, has significant roles in aging, and it has significant roles in development. For example, it's very, very uh, much involved with myelination. So is uh, propofol's inhibition of sirtuin-2 uh, part of neurotoxicity? Is a, it would be an interesting question. The LFA-2, the integrin, leukocyte function antigen, uh, we also have pulled out a highly specific and, and uh, high affinity site in this particular uh, protein that inhibits its function. And so leukocyte function is uh, inhibited by a range of different anesthetics, notably sevoflurane, isoflurane, and somewhat less so to propofol. This is work done in collaboration with, um, with Koichi Yuki up at Boston Children's. So a number of different side effect targets are, are slowly being accumulated as being affected by these drugs. There are many, 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 many more that we need to understand. So if we're going to improve our drugs, one approach is not only to improve it on the GABA receptor, but also to disfavor it on some of these side effect targets. So what's emerging, I think, this is now in the realm of opinion, uh, is that the synapse is uh, emerging as a super target for these drugs. So every one of the proteins that I've shown here in this cartoon, are in, there is a literature backing its effect, uh, having an interaction with a general anesthetic. Uh, uh, I haven't talked about mitochondria at all, but mitochondrial targets are, are uh, I, I think, uh, something that we should pay some attention to. Uh, but all of the rest of these are as well. Uh, this would suggest that there's a loss of synaptic transmission and connectivity. Uh, there's uh, a fair amount of work going on now looking at uh, organ level uh, uh, representations of connectivity in the brain. Uh, this is work from Alex Proke, who is now at Penn looking at EEG connectivity. And what he finds in the awake state, looking at propofol or at ketamine, going to the anesthetized state, you have a uh, fairly dramatic loss in connectivity, somewhat less so with ketamine. And interesting, if you look at uh, um, uh, one of the posters next, bo next door um, that uh, isoflurane sort of causes a mixed effect, which might not be unexpected uh, based, on, uh, based on the number of molecular targets and the number of sites that isoflurane has in, in comparison to propofol. So quick summary. Unbiased enrichment strategies have uh, identified several of these, uh, uh, both ligand and voltage-gated channels. Uh, reproduced its conserved sites, I think, are beginning now to emerge. Uh, we still need to attach function to some of them. Uh, 
Uh, mutagenesis separates binding from activity, uh, suggesting transduction of occupancy. And it's interesting that anesthetics in these transduction zones suggest a need for free volume. Anesthetics need to go to a space that has a cavity that has free volume is needed in those spaces to facilitate the movement that underlies transduction. And it may not be a coincidence that these anesthetics tend to localize in these particular regions. And then finally, that the integration of a host of molecular events into the behavioral state of anesthesia uh, is really our next frontier, um, be it from PET, be it from EEG, be it from MR. Uh, there are a number of such studies taking place right now that are going to help us uh, uh, translate these molecular events up to, uh, up to the organ level function. So you know, with that, I'm going to stop, and thank you much for your attention. Questions for Dr. Eckenhoff? Just a quick thought. Um, anesthetics are xenobiotics. So there is nothing inherent that would constrain a worm in a human to maintain a binding site in a protein. So my question is really, isn't it possible that it's through some other mechanism? You, you're hinting at insertion into bilayers and things like that, where something could be going on? Yeah. Or am I uh, off base on that? Yeah. Uh, Jim and I were just discussing this ahead of time. This has been a very, very long discussion as to whether or not that's the case. My view is that anesthetics are unique in the fact that they're very small. Their volumes, their molecular volumes are typically on the order of 100 to 200 uh, Daltons, their, their masses, their volumes are very small. Um, proteins have filling defects known as cavities. Uh, they have, if you look at a distribution of cavities across the stru three-dimensional structures that we have, that we have access to, unlike the PDB, um, the, the, uh, the distribution of cavity volumes that can accommodate an anesthetic size molecule is very large. And they're mostly, most of these cavities are internal, they're mostly hydrophobic, they're mostly uncharged. And so um, I, I guess the best answer to your question is, is yes, but it could also be protein. I, I don't see the difference between uh, going, into membrane pro, going into membranes themselves and going into membrane proteins. I think it's a similar sort, it's gonna be a similar sort of situation.